Philip, welcome to the podcast. Happy to have yeah. you here. Thanks for having me. It's great. I think. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we, that's yet to be determined. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I've known, yeah, I've known you for several years um, now, and you've you've helped me navigate through some, you know, challenging, you know, challenging scenarios. You've helped me gain clarity around my next steps, and in a way that's really aligned with, you know, who I am and who, you know, I, I was wanting to become at the time, and still am today. Um, what I, what I appreciate the most about you is that you always kind of get to the chase. Like there's no excess fat with you. You just get right to the meat of the issue and you're really able to see people and sort of understand what they need in the moment. It's really lovely, lovely to see. Thank you. Yeah. I, um, yeah. I don't know what to say to that other than that's why I'm here. I just think life, um, I think life is really long. Um, and, uh, I don't think it's as short as, as many people often think it is. A lot of us are driven by scarcity at the same time. Um, it's not an urgency, but I just think there's an opportunity to kind of cut a little bit clearer to what's really going on in our lives. I just had a lady literally an hour ago doing a coaching call and she said two things. She said, once, first of all, she said, I don't really know what I want out of life. And two is I'm not very good at explaining myself. Turns out both are bullshit. Um, she was very clear uh, at what she didn't want, which led and shot, you know, kind of shone a big light in terms of what she does want. And the second thing was um, she's beautifully articulate. She just doesn't like who she is and therefore doesn't like how she's showing up in the world. So we were just able to just go there a little bit faster than perhaps she's used to. But that intimidates a lot of people as well. Yeah. And I think, you know, for the, for the listener who may not necessarily know, you know, exactly what you do and what your scope of work is, let's, let's actually start with your, you know, how you got into this line of work. I know, you know, being from Ireland, it's not necessarily the culture with the greatest affinity for, you know, feeling sharing all the time. So what, you know, maybe your upbringing was like, and then how you, and, and describe what it is that you actually do. So you mentioned coaching, but let's, let's do a deeper dive on that. Yeah, I mean, growing up in Ireland, Ireland's an interesting place. I mean, when, when it's not a place that it is one of the most passionate places on earth, as far as I'm concerned, ex except we struggle to um, express that. Um, a lot of artists, a lot of writers, a lot of poets, a lot of you know songwriters have come out of Ireland, a lot of actors, um, and they almost use their modality to express who they are in the world. But when it comes to face-to-face -face conversations, like literally, I just came back from Ireland a few days ago, and it's not a criticism, it's more of an observation where about two or three, maybe even five years ago, probably even closer and more accurately, I would have seen this as a direct criticism. My aunt passed away, so my mother has two sisters and um, they're very close and her youngest sister passed away literally while I was in Ireland. And the moment the phone call came in, my dad was sitting in one couch at the end of the, the living room, my mother on the other couch at the other end of the living room. And the living room is not very big. It's a very modest little house in a little suburb just outside of Dublin. And um, my dad got the phone call to deliver the news, but didn't embrace my mother, didn't hug my mother, didn't you know, console her in the way that perhaps you and I might do or the way we're kind of maybe a little bit more familiar. And he just kind of sat there stoically and allowed my mother to process and whatever. Um, and I think that gives an insight. Like there wasn't a lot of touchy feely. There was no hugs. There was no, I never, ever heard my dad tell me he loves me. Um, I struggled a lot growing up as a kid. And I think that has formed a lot of the why behind the work I do. I was very lonely. I was very isolated. Um, and I, I really struggled to understand who I was at the core and therefore how I was going to show up in the world. I really struggled with that. So it was a, a real deep identity challenge for me. And I think that's formed a lot of the work I do. So as much as I'd love to think that my work comes from a place of inspiration, it actually comes from a place of, of trying to eliminate the pain for others that I myself experienced. And I think that's why I'm, I, I'm so passionate and so driven to do what I do. So coaching, I run retreats. I basically want people to show up in the world where they're proud of who they are. I want them to demonstrate their gifts, not just their talents. I want them to make an impact in the world. I want them to show up so that they, when they look in the mirror, they like who they see and they don't judge them, themselves to death and back every single day. And when they lie in their deathbed many years from now, they don't you know, reel with some of those regrets that have been in many ways unnecessary. And my job is to eliminate those, as many of those as I can um, before, you know, with people who want to work with me before they die. So you mentioned that you run retreats. There's one in particular that sort of encapsulates everything that you just said. Uh, the one, I mean, there's many that you, uh, we're going to unpack all of them, but the one last talk uh, event that you run and you run this all over the world. Um, I love what you're saying around bringing the convers like the deathbed conversation, like the things that, you know, maybe we wait for yep. our entire lives to hear, you know, you're really, 
I think, and I've had the, you know, opportunity to, you know, attend one of those events, you're really bringing those conversations forward and you're, you know, delivering that you're, I mean, maybe you can explain, you know, what the premise is behind the one, you know, behind one last talk and what are some of the rules around giving, around giving a talk like that? Yeah. I mean, I think it starts with, you know, the, this anecdotal story that's actually based in, in a real story about the, the son who goes to the hospital to say goodbye to his father. Um, well, he didn't say go to say goodbye. He went to the hospital to visit his father who's dying. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and the doctor comes out, he's in the waiting room and he says, it's time. And the son says he's dying. And he goes, no, he's dying, but it'll be three or four days before he passes away. But he says, it's time now for the conversation. And the son looks at the doctor and says, what conversation? He said, the conversation you probably should have had 20 years ago. And I feel that there's, there's, there's so many people. My wife just had a conversation with her dad. Um, and I may literally, again, just, uh, I, you know, the, the, the irony of timing on this, because I know you and I rescheduled and, and that was my fault. But she literally just had a conversation with her father. And it may probably the last conversation she had. Now, I won't share what she said, but it was absolutely stunning it was just mind-blowing in terms of the peace that she has from the conversation and also the gift she gave her father about how she feels about him but a lot of us wait until those deathbed moments we wait too late in life so the premise behind one last talk is if you had one last talk to give to the world what would you say and who would you say it to and a couple of the rules of engagement is you're not allowed to speak about Donald Trump. You're not allowed to speak about global warming. You're not allowed to speak about the, the health system. You're not allowed to speak about where, what you think people should do in the world. You're, it's, it's a narrative. It's a part of your personal truth. And it's an opportunity for you to share a part of yourself that perhaps you've hidden from the world, that you don't want the world to know that you're ashamed of. Because when you share your truth, you give other, permission to do, other people permission to do the same. And one of the things we all want in this world is we want to be seen and we want to be valued in this world, yet many of us hide and we're, we have parts of ourselves that we don't like. And we, we think by shining a light on those things, people will judge us. It's actually the opposite. By, by, by ignoring those things, we cannot fully show up in this world. Um, and that's what One Last Talk is based on. And we're actually creating a book called One Last Book, which is going to basically help people to, uh, we're doing workshops on that, how, how to basically write your, your memoir. Um, and then the next book is going to be the one last conversation, which is how do you have navigate conversations with people that assuming that perhaps this might be your last conversation, what would you like to say to them? And, um, that's, that's the mission behind the one last movement. Why do you think it's so encounter? Why is it so counterintuitive for people to share? You know, I think that the initial thinking around, okay, I have this one last talk. I'm going to talk about something, you know, intimately personal that happened to me or that I did to somebody else. And it's, it's terrifying. It can be terrifying because it's like, what if somebody actually sees me? But the flip side of that is, you know, after you finish the talk, you're like, wow, somebody saw me, you know, it's, it's the same, it's sort of two sides of the same coin. Why, why do you think it's so counterintuitive for people to share these, like these, you know, profoundly personal experiences or sad or painful experiences with, with yeah, others? Yeah. I think one of the I know for me, certainly one of the big things is I was so desperately wanted to be liked. And from a very early age, I started wearing all sorts of masks to try to fit in because I thought that was the thing I should do. Yeah. Um, and it was a, it was a tragic thing when I look back and I look back with a lot of, you know, sorrow and a lot of, you know, now thankfully uh, a degree of compassion and also maybe a sliver, still remaining sliver of judgment. But I'll give you a couple of examples. I remember a, a gentleman called Chris spoke, uh, he did his one last talk in, in Vancouver and I remember when I asked him, often we have a very interesting reaction from people. We ask them, sometimes they want to puke up and vomit. Sometimes they get angry. Sometimes they get sad. Sometimes mm-hmm. they're elated and then they realize, holy shit. Or, but, but the most common reaction we typically get is, oh my God, uh, wow. Uh, yeah, well, I really appreciate the invitation, but I think you should call Stephanie. Um, or you should call Philip. I think their <laughs> stories are like, these are friends of mine. They're great stories, but I don't think I have a story. So even that alone is very telling about the value in which people feel that they possess in the world. Mm. But this man, Chris said to me, he said, Philip, I just don't have a one last talk right now. He said, I'm not in a great place and I don't think I'm, I'm the best candidate. Why don't you come back in a couple of years when I've got my shit together? And I said, no, I said, I think the world is yearning for more truth and more you know, visibility into people's lives, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He shared his one last talk, which at the time was entitled, Everything is Awesome, Not. And when at the end of his talk, he didn't say, I have it figured out. He said, I'm just in a better place than I was, but I've, I, I'm still in a tough place in my life and I've still got a long way to go. He got a standing ovation, but the most telling thing was the amount of people that came up, hugged him, 
and said, thank you for giving me permission to name that I'm not in a good place and giving me permission to allow myself to know that that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, because we are in a world where often what is being portrayed or presented is, is obviously our, the best foot forward type of thing. So we're just afraid of not being liked. And we think by hiding parts of ourselves, and I don't mean hiding as in people are out of integrity. We're all hiding. We're all hiding at some level. We're all shy in an area of our life. We're all wearing a mask. And it's not an integrity issue. It's just that it's not an intuitive thing for us to necessarily demonstrate and show the parts of us that perhaps we're ashamed of, that we have judgment around, because we feel that we're just afraid that if those things are seen by the world, the world won't like what they see. Right. And in fact, what I find, it's the absolute, absolute, complete opposite. I had a lady one day who came to me in a, I was in the gym actually. And she says, I heard you're the guy to talk to. And I'm thinking, well, <laughs> oh no. Talk about. <laughs> she says, I'm going to a really important interview and I'm shit scared. Mm -hmm. Have you any strategies about getting rid of the fear? And I said, no. And she goes, what? And I, and she thought I was joking. And I said, no, why don't you walk in straight in there, sit down and tell them how nervous you are. She goes, you can't do that. And I said, why not? I said, walk in, they're going to see it anyway. They're going to feel it inside of you. Walk in, sit down and say, guys, before we start, I just want to say one thing. I'm really nervous, but please don't take that as any sign of weakness or a demonstration that I don't want this. I'm nervous because this matters to me. Now, please feel free to ask me any question you want to. And she goes, but what if they don't like that? And I said, do you want to work for an organization or a group of people who don't appreciate your truth? Well, that tells you. So why can't we just be a bit more honest about how we are and how we feel in the world today? And, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's easy to sit here and say it, but I myself struggle with this every single day. And I, and I think I've watched Giovanni. So my partner, uh, Giovanni, for the listener, has gone to this one last talk, gave a one last talk at one of your events in Toronto. And I remember him going through the process of constructing the story. And I think one of the things that it does is it gives you at least it, it, it starts to build a bridge for you to understand who you are at your core or who you are, you know, the essence of who you are and what you stand for. Now we've talked, I, I, I definitely want to be getting into this concept that you talk about around your gifts are, are right beside your wounds, because I think that that is really also part of the essence of, of what we're talking about here, right? Being okay with, you know, having done bad things or poor, made poor choices in the past or, or being victimized in some way. And I think that um, I, I, can, I can share a personal story. Giovanni and I went to one of your, um, uh, it was a brave couple, but it was your brave couple retreat that you had in Boulder. You were yep. hosting a couple day workshop in Boulder. And there was a question that you asked, which I think everybody should try. I could not answer the question at the time. It was strip off, you, you take off your titles. You're not the doctor anymore. You're not the mother. You're not the partner. You're not the job title. Who are you? What, who are you at your essence? Who, what is, you know, represent yours. And then you also made it even more difficult by saying you can't write it. You can't write who you are. You have to draw it. <laughs> so this was so, um, I mean, if you ever try to, you know, if anybody's listening, this is a, an incredibly difficult exercise. But in the same way, constructing this one last talk is really getting closer to who you are. And that question for me, I mean, I don't know if you remember this, but I had such a visceral reaction. I was so, I was infuriated by the question because I couldn't figure out what the answer was right away. And it was, you know, of course you sort of unpack that and it's, you know, there's fear around that and, and, and all that. But um, giving a one last talk or is, is a, is a, medium for you to get closer to who you already are. You've just put on so many layers and so many filters and so many schemas that you're sort of always running through. Um, I think it's, a, I think it's a brilliant idea. Yeah. And I think one of the challenges for a lot of people, whether it's one last talk is, are not even in, in terms of giving back and, 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 and making an impact in the world. I think we all at, at a, at a deep level want to make an impact in the world. We want to do something good in the world, mm -hmm. but the challenge is for many of us, we, we want to look good doing it. Um, and I think that's the Achilles heel. That's the thing that can distort reality, distort the stories we tell, the stories we tell ourselves, never mind the stories we tell in a public domain. Yeah. So that's one of the greatest challenges when we work these, do these workshops, these speaker workshops, is, is people want to look good. They just really struggle with the idea of sharing something without being able to tie it in a bow. 
And, and I think that's the most refreshing part of one last talk is that it doesn't have to be in a bow. You're presenting who you are to the world, but giving somebody permission somewhere on the, another side of the world to say, holy shit, Stephanie struggles with that. Mm -hmm. And I believe her story matters. I struggle with that. Maybe my story matters. If my story matters, oh my God, maybe I matter. And what it does is it starts to shift the perspective from somebody that has been judging where they're at in their lives. And I think where they're, I, one thing I've realized categorically over the last couple of years in coaching is that when there's judgment present, there's zero opportunity for growth. It, like the judgment sucks all of the oxygen out of the room. And as so many of us are judging where we are in our lives, therefore it makes it really, it's probably one of the greatest inhibitors to the clarity about who we could become, who we want to become, what could be next for us. Um, so we, we, work, we work very hard to try and take that judgment off the table and present who you are and, and, and not be proud, but just in a, a deep level of acceptance of who you are and how you've shown up in the world to date. And how do you think, where do you think that the judgment comes from? Um, I think it's, I think a lot of us at a core level, we don't, we don't like who we are. I mean, I, I know it sounds like it may be a strange statement, but uh, the lady I just spoke to, you know, within the last couple of hours, the end of the day, she, you know, she originally came to me because she has some challenges, challenges in her business that turned out to be some challenges in her personal life, which ultimately led back to this sense that she doesn't really like who she is. She has not really ever really liked who she is, partly because she doesn't know who she is and partly because, you know, she hasn't shown up in the, in the world away. So for her, she, she struggles with this dilemma, which I have dubbed the 50-50 the mom. Um, she's, she's trying to build a business um, and she's struggling there and she desperately wants to be an amazing mother and she feels she's struggling there. And she feels, when I presented this to her, she said, you just nailed it. She said, I feel like I'm doing both 50%, which doesn't equal 100. I mean, I mean like there's a deficiency right. there. She feels like yeah. she's not quite succeeding in anything in her life. And, um, and, and that, that, that space that she's at is just, is just horrible. And a lot of us, you know, we, we end up doing things, you know, all of us carry shame. We've all done things to upset other people. We've all been upset mm -hmm. by other people, hurt by other people. And um, a lot of us don't have a, a very high opinion of ourselves. And I'm not talking about cockiness or overconfidence or arrogance. I'm just talking about just yeah. a sense of like, you know what? I'm a good person. I'm actually a good person and I've made mistakes and I will continue to fuck up in this world, but I'm not a bad person. And uh, I think when you can get to that place where, for example, for myself, when I look back at my childhood, I have some genuine sense of compassion towards the person I was. Uh, rather than judgment. And as soon as that compassion showed up, my life changed. It just absolutely changed. And I can't show you on a spreadsheet how, but it just did. Mm -hmm. And the shame and guilt, is that parson with anger? Do you think that there's self-hatred happening there as well? Or is, are, they, are they distinct things? Like how do you define the shame, the guilt, and if that, if that goes along with anger? Yeah, I think at the at the very deep rooted part of it, I, I'm not a big fan of, you know, I don't think, you know, I'm not saying fear doesn't exist. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. And I'm not saying it, it's not real. It's just, a, it's, it's, it's probably a pussycat compared to the monster or the lion that, um, that shame is. And, and the more I've sat with shame, and recently I did a, a, an exercise around shame with a group of clients. And I decided actually I, I would do the exercise myself. And when I say exercise, it wasn't that elaborate, but we just talked about the concept of shame and I presented some ideas. And then we just sat down and we made, basically made a list on a journal and, and, and you know, literally you know, a piece of paper and wrote out all the things that you know, we can identify shame within ourselves or activities that we did or things we didn't do that bring shame up in us today or has historically brought up shame. I was absolutely blown away by the amount of shame that I was carrying as a human being, despite all the work I've done. I never believe I've arrived. Um, I think I've got a mountain to go. I'm probably, you know, 30% of the way towards the person I, you know, I want to be and the person I feel I can be. Um, but astonishing the amount of shame that I, that I uncovered within myself. And um, I feel that that's the thing that a lot of us have to deal with. And what I did was I, I instantly booked, um, you know, a therapy session because I'm a huge fan of therapy and I take on a lot of people's stuff. So I feel it's important that I go out into the world and, and demonstrate what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I remember sitting down with this therapist only literally within the last seven or eight weeks and, and starting to work through some of these things. And it's been profound. Yet a lot of us take shame and bury it put it in a box, bury it six foot, foot under the ground, put a lock on it and assume that, you know, once it's out of sight, it's out of mind. Right. But it's never out of your mind. You're carrying it every single day, all the things you've done and the things you haven't done that you're not, not, you're not proud of.
And do you think that that can distort? So having that shame around, you know, whatever the experience or opinion that you have around yourself, does that distort your intuition? You've said that word a couple of times and yeah. I want to, I want to sort of parse that a little bit, the shame in, interact with or distort your intuition. Yeah, it absolutely distorts it and diminishes it and blocks it and clouds it. Um, I mean, I think intuition is, is on a very basic human level is, is, just listening to what we're feeling rather than, you know, it's, it's, it's not an intellectual thing. So, um, and it's, and it's, and it's, it's kind of this internal voice that's showing us our true North as corny as cliche that might sound to some, but it comes down to this idea of trust that do I trust what I'm feeling? And most people, when you think about trust, trust is such an extraordinary conversational piece. You mm. think about trust. We often associate trust with the bank manager, with the mortgage broker, with the doctor, with the babysitter, et cetera, et cetera, with my partner, et cetera. But I actually often present trust as an, an, an internal conversation with clients. And can anyone who's listening to this today or in the future, if I present this, I, this, this very simple question is, do you absolutely trust yourself? And I'm not looking for 60%, 40%, 30%. I'm looking for yes or no. Because when you, you know, when, when you, when you kind of split it in the middle and you start to break it down, it gives you a way out. And most people, if they're honest with themselves, would probably say, no, I don't fully trust myself. Um, and then you start to look at, well, why? What, what are the things that have happened to you? What are the things you've done that have put you in a position where you just don't, don't have a strong sense of trust? Um, within yourself. And it's, a, it's an amazing conversation. Now we can go into a place of, again, back to this judgment piece, we can judge self, oh, God, here I am 47 years old. I'm just talking about myself here. I don't trust myself as much as I could for God's sake, like, and I get over it. And it's very, or I can be deeply curious, which is the other opportunity and say, Jesus, wow, I'm 47 years old and I've done okay in this world, not trusting myself. What would happen in this world if I could trust myself and trust how I feel, trust my intuition and lean into who I believe I'm meant to be in the world? So trust is a huge conversational piece that not many people are having, or if they are, it's external as opposed to internal. So I feel like this may be my intellect asking the question and you can, you can be the judge of that, but my, what's popping into my head as you're, as you're saying this is, okay, so what are the frameworks around trust? So my answer would be no, I do not 100% categorically trust myself, but that's because I don't think that I have the frameworks around or the, at least maybe the, maybe it's the experience around trusting myself and following my intuition. And I mean, I think I'm getting better at it as I, as I go along, but, uh, and it's, of course it's a work in process, but do you have frameworks or are there suggestions that one might uh, start to undergo where there's little exercises in self-trust and self-agency that, uh, that can help harness that? No, I'm, I, I don't really. I'm more of a fan of understanding why the trust isn't there. So what I would do is I'd bring somebody back into their past and start to examine where trust showed up in their lives, where they witnessed trust. So one of the things, you know, for example, with, when it comes to working with couples, you know, I think I'm a huge, well, I know I'm a huge fan of going back into what they witnessed. So, so what's their relationship to relationships, for example? And so what are you talking about? What did you witness? What did you see when you grew up around at home? Mm -hmm. And when you understand that within yourself, but then more importantly, your partner starts to understand with that and within you. So for example, use the hug thing with my dad earlier on. Yeah. My wife, based on that, that realization would probably say, holy shit, that's what's made Philip who he is, or that's what has informed who I am. So I would go back and examine trust as it relates to your early part of your life. I think going back into the past is one of the most underrated things on earth when it comes to development, personal growth, growing as a person, understanding your future, understanding, getting clear about your future. I have a saying that the past has created the present. And the present is creating the future. In other words, everything you've been, everything you've done, everything has been done to you has informed and developed a large part of not entirely who you are today. Therefore, everything you're doing has been done to you today is determining your future. Most people are trying to, they're trying to live in the now or they're trying to plan for the future. I, I actually think that, that, is, that is, is, is very limited. You go back into your past and you uncover take all those bricks, all those boxes out of the ground that you've buried, roll over all of those, those stones. Don't live there. Don't get lost in the pain. Don't get lost in the past, but examine it and then start to bridge. You talk about a bridge, you know, create that bridge to the, to the present. How is my past determined who I am today around money, around love, around intimacy, around friendship, around anger, around shame? Keep filling the gap. 
And what it allow you to do is to rewrite the script in a very, very real way for the future. So I'm a huge fan in going back with any of these conversations into the past and creating questions and exercises around the past that will allow you to understand where it came from. That will inform, not the frameworks, but that will inform the actions that you need to take in order to move forward. Right. And do you think, you know, being able to sit with, you know, some of the emotions that you, that we've talked about, you know, anger, uh, trust, um, you know, do these things have a, you know, being able to sit with them and understand them and unravel them, do they have a purpose? Does your pain, like the things that you have gone through, do those, do those things have a purpose for you in terms of your development? Absolutely. Only if you allow them to. Most people would see those things, a lot of those things as negative. Pain is negative. And when you say to somebody, in a, and maybe it's too premature for them, that the very thing, the very pain you've been through, whether you've been you know, uh, bullied, whether you've been you know, abused in some capacity, whether you went through a divorce, you lost a great friend, whatever those things are, whether you are right or wronged in those situations, they have informed who you are. And for some people, it's a little bit early to tell them or present this idea to them that the pain they've experienced is actually in some way has, 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 has in, its, in, its, in its wake created something beautiful. And um, the, ultimate, the ultimate gift, I think, to the world, the ultimate goal with this stuff is to take the greatest pain you've experienced and actually help other people with that. Because if you go back in time and you go back 10 years, five years, six months, even today, and you say, who's the person I need to meet? Who's the person that I would need to have talked to or met in order to fast track my growth in this particular area? The opportunity is for you to become that person. Whether you monetize or not, leave all that shit aside. Um, and I say shit because I think there's so much pressure on people to monetize passion, to monetize giving back, monetize coaching, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe you, you do. I worked in, pub, in a pub for years working, uh, coaching people one hour every week for six weeks. And most people don't know about this, Stephanie. And I'd sit upstairs in a little landing area and I'd order a cup of tea. I couldn't afford a meeting room. And um, I would ask them to pay, for, pay what they felt it was worth and we would give that money to a charity. I did that for years. I had no plan, no aspirations to be a coach, to, to run retreats around the world, et cetera, et cetera. That, was, that came organically through that. I think deep down I yearned it, but I, I didn't believe I was good enough or capable of doing it. So this is really coming back to this idea of your gifts are, you've said this many times, your gifts are right beside your wounds. And it, it reminds me, there's a, I can't remember exactly the Rumi quote, but it's something like where the pain is, is where the light gets in or so, it's something like that. I think for so many people, the idea of going into where their wounds are, it can feel so bottomless and uh, you know, dark and forceful. It can be, it can be really scary, but I love, I love what you're saying around turning this into a gift. So maybe you can define gift. You've used gift and talent. I think not interchangeably. I think you have a distinct meaning between the two. Yeah. Well, a gift is something that you're very, is you're, sorry, a talent is something you're good at. So for example, I might be talented at writing code. Does that mean I should spend the rest of my time you know, writing code um, you know, for a living? Mm-hmm. Um, maybe, maybe not. But the gift is something that is, is it's a gift. It's, a, it's temporary. It's something you've been given that you have an opportunity to, to pass on into the world. Mm-hmm. A gift is something that is not you. It's passing through you in a spiritual realm. A gift is something that um, whether it was intentional or not, the universe has presented to you, God, whoever you, whatever you believe in. Um, so for me, you know, I spend a lot of time wallowing in a very, 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 um, you know, in a very calculated way. It looked like I was, you know, growing and being proactive, but I was, I was allowing myself to be a victim to the stories, like being dyslexic, being bullied, being ostracized, being lonely, and all those sorts of things. Until I start, started to finally realize that all of these pain points have given me a wonderful ability to see the world. If you're blind, your your hearing is better. If you're dyslexic, you can, you feel different things in the world and that you see the world in a different way. So the the pain points present an opportunity for you to grow or to be able to see the world in a different way. It's what you're going to do with those things. Um, So for example, and I I love giving just real life examples. I had a lady called Chantel who rang me. She emailed and she said, can I get 15 minutes of your time? She was a coaching client of mine. And uh, I get on the call. She goes, I've got a, a talk coming up. Show me this on the email in advance. I just want to put the talk by you to see what you think. And she was going to be speaking for 15 minutes at some event in in, in Alberta. 
And we get on the call. I said, go for it. Tell me what it is. She said, well, it's about goal setting and this and you know that. And in my very beautiful, uh, sarcastic asshole way, I said, wow, I'm so inspired. My hairs are standing up. I've got goosebumps. And I did it in such a sarcastic tone. And she knows me. And she goes, well, F you, she said. I, I call here to help. You're looking for your help. And all you can do is have a go at my talk. I said, Chantal, you're better than this. I said, let me ask you a question. If you were to talk about something and you could barely hold back the tears, what would you speak about? And without missing a beat, she said, bullying. Now, with respect to Chantel, she's five foot nothing. She's tiny, right? She's, a, I don't know, she's so small and petite. And uh, I, I just made the natural assumption. I said, was it bad? And she goes, yeah. And I said, how many of them were there? And was it over a period of time? She goes, oh, no, no, no. Let's, let's be clear, Philip. I was the bully. Mm-hmm. And I said, how bad was it? She said, horrendous. And I said, wow. well, what about speaking about bullying? She goes, well, what if, what if I cry? And I said, what about it? She says, what if they judge me? I said, well, what about it? She ended up going to this event, speaking. She got a standing ovation. She cried. Everyone cried. And from that one speaking event, she got something like 12 speaking events across northern Alberta to high school, speaking to kids that have been bullied and kids that bully. And it freed her from the shackles of the thing that no one knew about. Because if they knew I was mean and horrible and mm. nasty to other other kids in vulnerable situations, everything that I've built up, my Facebook profile, you know, my, my, my business card, my, my, my stories would mean nothing. In fact, that was the most powerful thing she's ever done in her life because, you know, she was able to, to, to literally let go of the thing that had gripped her and held her inside. And that's the other thing is a lot of people might say, well, why would she bother sharing that? You know, if no one knows about it, there's no, you know, there's no harm in just holding it within ourselves. But we don't realize the cost of holding these things within ourselves until we let them out. Mm-hmm. You don't realize how dysfunctional your previous relationship was with a man or a woman until you get out of that dysfunctional relationship into a better relationship. And now you have context. Now you have perspective. And now you go, oh my God, he was a complete ass. But you don't know that until afterwards. What you thought was normal often now becomes, you know, out of, abnormal or, or out of, you know, just out of who you are. Yeah. And my mother has severe arthritis and, and I ask her, you know, how's your, how's your pain? And she would say, oh, it's on a bad day. And if I could get a probe and stick it into her hip and then stick it into my hip for me to experience the exact same pain, I would be on my knees screaming. That's my suspicion. Yeah. Because we become so used to the pain and the dullness and the exhaustive nature of surviving and trying to please everybody else rather than living the dreams, the aspirations, and running the risks of falling flat on our own faces. Yeah, it's uh, chiropractors have a uh, saying, what is common is not necessarily normal. And I'm, I'm sure it's not just inherent to chiropractors. It's just, you know, that's the, the world that I, that I used to play in. And it's, it's, if from a physical realm, you can also see that as well. You can see people come in with like low grade back pain or headaches, like, oh, you know, it's just my regular monthly headache. It's like, that's actually not normal for you to have a monthly headache or for you to have ongoing low back pain. So this is why I wanted to have this conversation with you. It parses really well when we, when we talk about, you know, some of the misalignments that, that we have. We have, there's, you know, physical sources of misalignment, you know, chemical, diet, what have you. Uh, we were talking a little bit about this in the pre-chat and then, and then this emotional idea of misalignment as well. And if you have somebody who, you know, uh, your client, like you were saying, the ability for her to be vulnerable, I mean, that is, you know, taking off her mask and just saying like, this is who I am. You know, I was a bully. I'm not proud of it, but this is what I learned from it. This is how I'm different now. You know, and to your point, everything that you've done in your past has shaped and molded, uh, you know, and produced the person that you are today. You know, that is such a freeing, I can just imagine how freeing that must have felt for her. In the same way that when someone gives a one last talk, it's like, I don't want anyone to see me. But then, you know, you let everybody see you and you're like, and they all saw me and it was all great. And, you know, we all, we all got together and there's connection that was fostered there. Totally. A hundred percent. Um, it's, it's, we're amazing creatures and we, we, uh, we complicate our lives a lot. And we talk about alignment as a huge conversation in the work I do. I mean, the lady, again, I just spoke to within the last couple of hours, you know, she's wondering why her happiness level on a scale of one to 10 is hovering around between four and five and oscillating up and down, but it hasn't really gone beyond that. Number one is she's probably just been really hard on herself, which is, which is, is not uncommon. But the second thing is if you just look at her life, you know, she, she's doing work she doesn't want to do. 
um, she has a, an idea of a, of a business that she wants to create that she thinks is, is, is exciting, but she wants to build it in a city that she doesn't want to live in. And, um, and one of the big things for her is she goes, well, you know what, this is all I know. And I don't know what I, you know, I don't know what I don't know. And I don't know where I want to live. And I don't know what the work I want to do, which my answer with, with a lot of compassion and sometimes a lot of sarcasm is that's, that's not true. I, I don't believe that for one second. And there's something I've seen, Stephanie, that is, is increasing more and more and more is often the thing that we do, if we're out of alignment within the work that we do, sometimes it's the work we do or the way in which we show up in the work. So for example, me, if I don't constantly reinvent how I show up as a coach or a speaker, um, you know, it, it becomes stale and I can't live like that. I just cannot live like that. After living for 40 something years as, as stale, I can't do that ever, ever again. I just won't compromise who I am in that regard. Um, but I find that for her, it's not what she's doing right now. It's not the next idea. It's what lies beyond both. Hmm. It's not the thing she's doing. It's not the thing she thinks is the answer. It's what lies beyond both. And the thing that she wanted, she thinks she wants to do and the business she wants to create is an escape. Okay. It's like an affair. Sometimes we have an affair, not because we love somebody else, but because we actually, it's an escape from the thing that we don't want, but it's not necessarily the perfect relationship for us. If there's such a thing, which probably doesn't exist. Uh, and in terms of like perfect, perfect, everything's amazing. It's what lies beyond both. And I'm fascinated by that idea. And we've created this conversation around one last startup. If you had one last business to create one last startup to, to, to create, mm. what would you do? Would you, would you continue to do what you do? Or maybe not. Would you present the idea that you think the world wants or the, the widget or the app that will sell to Google for a billion dollars? Or would you reach into your back pocket and take out the thing that scares the living shit out of you? That you're, you're afraid to show up. That's the greatest expression of who you are. Would you put that on the chopping block for, block for conversation and put that on the chopping block for an opportunity to grow that? Um, I don't know if you've heard of Techstars, but it's, a star, it's, a, it's an incubator, a startup um, accelerator for, they have offices all over the world. Um, they've, they've invested in organizations worth, I don't know, 100 billion at this stage. So the founder of Techstars and myself have been talking back and forth on this idea of one last startup. And he agrees 100% with me, David Cohen is his name, that there are so many people out there that have an idea that is in their back pocket that they're unwilling to bring out into the world because it's the greatest expression of who they are. And it's easier to fail doing something you don't want to do or something that you're not fully passionate about than run the risk of putting this thing on the table and saying, hey, this is who I am. This is what I want to do. Hey, world, are you ready? Oh, 100%. Yeah, that's way easier. <laughs> it's way easier to fail and to you know, be unfulfilled at a life that isn't necessarily fulfilling for you in any way and to be able to continue to complain and have, you know, attach yourself to that story rather than actually going for what yeah. you want with the possibility of not being able to achieve it. Mm, yeah. 100%. Let's talk about how this parses with your concept of soul set. This is something that you've been talking for, about for a couple of years. And I like the way that you talk about running everything through, you know, we, we, you know, we often walk around, you know, we've sort of made this comment, before, you know, in, or in our conversation today around, it's just really easy for us to walk around cut off from the throat down. You know, we're just, our bodies are just these containers for our cerebral, for our brains to kind of get around. And you talk about this idea of becoming attuned to or running things through your soul set and you, you sort of have a Venn diagram of you know your relationship with yourself your relationship with your work and your relationship with others can you walk us through what that means and then maybe how this you know uh, mediates or how this comes together with you know the one last startup the one and yep. and your one last yeah, I think to me that Venn diagram is, is, is a way of, of kind of almost expressing and showing what soul set means to me. Um, I think that is the next evolution and revolution for humanity. I think we live in this, in this information age and I think we, we've become stale and we need to move on. Um, and speaking of information, I think one way to demonstrate where we're stuck in that loop is the amount of information we're consuming. And we're reading the next, you know, we're reading like copious amounts of books and consuming way too much. And there's incredible information out there, but we're, we're consuming it in, in such a speed. And a lot of information, if we're very honest about it, is not driven by a need to inform or to grow, but it's driven by a scarcity. It's driven by, holy shit, if I don't read the next book, if I don't read the bestseller you know, list or whatever, I'm missing out on something and that I need that. So I encourage a lot of clients to slow down on the consumption that of the information they consume 
Because when we read a book, if we don't stop and create space to really allow the information to land, it's just information. Where if we create space, the information can drop from wit, from information to kind of knowledge, knowledge to, 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 to wisdom and wisdom to awareness. And then we can start to fundamentally shift as people. So to me, mindset is your thoughts. Okay, your mind is, you know, your mindset is your thoughts. It's, it's what you're thinking. It's your strategic mind. It's, it's your, your mind, which I don't trust at all. I don't trust my mind. My mind is manipulates. My mind second guesses. My mind uh, questions. Um, and your soul is basically what you're feeling. Um, so it's, it's just it's basically just dropping out of your head and it's connecting with what feels right. Uh, a quick example of this is I remember doing a workshop years ago and there was a lady, I don't know how she did it, but let's just say we met at nine o'clock and we kicked off at 9.30. But by 9.30, it felt like she'd gotten around to everybody in the room and told them all her story about how her husband had cheated on her and devastated her and broken her heart. And that's why she was in the room because she was crushed and she didn't know where she was going for the rest of her life, etc. So I kick off at 9.30 and I said, right, guys, quick question. Why are you here? Or more importantly, why are you really in this room? And she put her hand up. And you can just see she, again, she wants to share the story that validates a lot of her problems or challenges in the world. She proceeds to tell the story to which I look around, I get this feeling that everyone's heard the story. And I said, uh, so did you see it coming? She goes, absolutely not. I mean, nobody, my mother, my dad, my friends were all shocked. I was like blindsided. And I said, I don't believe you. I don't believe you for one second because you strike me as somebody who's super smart and super aware and has got a super intuition that you may not trust all the time, but that's a separate issue. And she looked at me and of course, what happened? She got absolutely, she was vibrate, she was shaking with anger. Mm. So I was like, how effing dare you tell me that I saw this coming? I've built my entire construct of my story around this victim story that I have been devastated and broken because of this man, which prevents me from living a, a beautiful life, which prevents me from allowing love back into my life, which prevents me finding my truth and my clarity and making decisions and moving out into this world. Don't you dare take that story away from me. And I said, okay, let's name the anger. She goes, no, I'm not angry. I said, I can feel it. You're just vi- you're vibrating. You want to smash my face in. Great. Now let's name it. And let's go beyond the anger. And as soon as she dropped the anger, she burst into tears. Her head went down. She lifted her face with her mascara all over her face. She was a complete mess. And she said, I knew it the day I met him. And I knew the day I walked down the aisle. Now, some might be going, why would you even present that possibility? Why would you get that? Because, because I don't ever want her to repeat that story again. I wanted to understand her part in all of this. So soul set to me is the future. It's about, you know, connection. It's about understanding who we are, getting out of our brains, moving through shame, moving through regrets, moving through fears, moving through those things to drop into our intuition, to use our brain in no more capacity than a MacBook. It's a MacBook Pro. It's an iPad. I don't give a shit. Pick your, pick your device. That's all it is. And some say we use 3% of our brain. So others argue, say we use 10% of the brain. And the, and the human goal is to use 40 or 50%. And if we did that, we, I would rather be wiped off this planet than run. There's a, you know, Star Trek. I don't know if you ever watched Star Trek, but some people might. Uh, oh, 100%. Laugh. Look up the Borg. And the Borg is a, is, a, is a race of people that is half machine, half human. They take all the parts of you out of you that allow you to feel and the conscious parts of you and they assimilate you. That's where we're heading in society. We're, we want to be assimilated. And to me, if we can start just to feel more, not just does it have a beautiful application in our personal lives, but it has an extraordinary application in our, in our professional lives. I have an entrepreneur reached out to me recently. He said, I just said no to a multi-million dollar deal that my CFO was drooling at. And when I said no, because all the spreadsheets said, yes, buy this business, all the data made sense. And he just said, it just does not feel right. And he said, it turns out it was the best decision ever. Who is Stanilov Petrov? Have you ever heard of Stanilov Petrov? Stanilov Petrov is the man who is now known as the man who prevented a world war. So in the early 80s, I think it was, when tensions were high between America and Russia. Yeah. There was, he was sitting at a station in Russia at the most sophisticated piece of technology on earth, flawless apparently, that was an early missile detection unit. So in other words, this computer would, would, would and, and radar system would identify nukes coming in from wherever they'd be shot from. And his job was to verify its, 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 
originality, verify that the machine is, is operating correctly, call upstairs, and then they would have an opportunity to retaliate. He never made the call, and yet he checked the machine multiple times. And for certain, according to the most sophisticated piece of technology on earth, these missiles were coming, not just one, but multiple missiles at this point. And in all the interviews, and I searched every single interview that I could ever find in this man, because I was intrigued by why he did not make that phone call up. He just said, I had a feeling in my gut. I had a fee. He's been now awarded all sorts of awards by presidents, by prime ministers, by, by, by royalty as a thank you for not making that single phone call. And I think we are so intuitive. And if we go back and look at a time where the data said the opposite, but we just said, fuck it, I'm going to go for this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to kiss this guy. I'm going to set this business up. I'm going to say no to this opportunity. I'm not going to walk across that street. And in many times that served you. You don't have to live every day from that place, but I think unfortunately so many people are, have deprived themselves of intuition. They've deprived themselves of the best, greatest organic thing in this opportunity to feel because we don't want to feel pain. But when we suppress the pain, when we don't exp- feel the pain, we take the beauty and we suppress it with it. By right. feeling the pain, which is temporary, we move through that, we accept it, we bring it with us, and we become way too reliant on the mind. So to me, soul set is, 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 is my body of work and my way of saying to people, hey, let's just get back to, and it's not, I wouldn't say it's new. I'm trying to get people back to this idea of feeling. It's the old new way of living as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I mean, you can make that argument for food. You know, we want to get back to the old way of actually having whole foods and not having these Franken foods. You can make the same argument with feeling. And I, I'm with you there. I think that as a society, we have divorced ourselves from our intuition, from our feeling, because it's also, you know, there's the trust that we've talked about. There's the, I mean, I can at least speak from my own experience. When you don't have the frame, when you don't know how to deal with the feeling, it can feel like it's going to consume you. Correct. So you distract yourself with work, you go get a degree, you go travel, you, you know, engage in whatever addictive, you know, food or shopping or, you know, whatever it is. Do you think that, um, do you think that soul set is when we think about, you know, this new old way, is it a way to, and I don't know how you feel about this word. I've heard you. uh, So you might, you might give me some blowback here, but do you feel that it is a way to make goals or is it a way to filter through and, and set goals for yourself? No, I actually think it's more of a way of allowing. allowing. I think it's about allowing things unfold. I'm not saying be absent of any type of aspirational things in the future, but it's actually, it's, it's goals are, in my personal opinion, have been very, have become very mechanical. They've become very intellectual. Um, and I think there's, there's real reality that when it comes to business, there's revenue targets and there's profitability targets and there's turnover and there's clients and acquisition and all that kind of stuff. I get that. But we've brought those same, those same principles into our personal lives. And I feel that we've become you know, a society of almost obsessive goal setting, mm-hmm. where I think there's, the, there's a place where, say, have some intentionality, have an idea of who you want to be in the world. So I do these, these exercises where I present people with a massive pieces of paper, give them a pen and say, I want you to draw using this this idea of isolated dreaming uh, three years out, who do you want to be in the world? How do you want to show up in the world? Not what you want, not yeah. what you want, but the sort of person you want to be and a, a way of, ex- you know, how you want to be. That was the question. That was the thing that I was furious at. That's such a, I mean, it's so brilliant, but it's, yes, yeah, sorry, go on. I just, so, 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 but it, but it is annoying. It's, it pisses people off and they can't answer it. And, but it's, it's, it's such a beautiful thing to have an opportunity to, and when, 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 when you get to somebody's truth, what they typically draw is something that is radically simplistic, not simplistic, radically simplistic, which it shouldn't be, but it's, I use the word radical because simplicity is the very thing that we've moved away from in the world. And then it's a case of saying, okay, if that's the thing, if that's the person I want to be, if that's the expression I want to make in the world, if that's how I want to show up, then trusting myself that I will automatically move towards that, that I don't have to set myself up and, and rigidly goal set in order to do that. So a quick example of, of trusting and, and, and this idea of, of accountability, for example, and accountability has a place, but I think that certainly in my work, I trust my clients implicitly. I trust them more than they trust themselves most of the time. And I remember doing a, I don't know what the hell it was, it was some workshop recently. Oh yeah, it was a, a two day workshop. And at the end of it, I said, right guys, so you could feel the fear starting to creep in. This idea that, okay, it's great in this room, Philip, but what happens when I get back to the real world? This fear that I'm not going to be okay on my own. Mm-hmm. Now as a coach, 
that is the greatest time to present your next program and exploit the situation. Some would say it's an opportunity just to offer something as an upsell or another. That's fine. That's not what I'm talking about. But people can be very vulnerable. And it's a great opportunity to say, you know what? Without saying it, I don't think you're going to be okay on your own. So by the way, I think you should sign up for the next 12 months or whatever. And I basically said, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we set up a Facebook group and I'll keep you accountable every week. And they just, oh my God, that'd be amazing. I said, because I'm not going to do that. And the people who knew me started to <laughs> laugh because they get my sense of humor. Yeah. But the people who didn't know me, they were actually annoyed. And I said, guys, if it's important, you're going to do it. And just even presenting that idea was unbelievable. And I said it in a group recently, I said, what if I presented this idea to you? I want to know how you're, you instantly react. What if the greatest work you have yet to do is ahead of you? That the greatest expression of who you are lies in your future. What emotion comes up for you? And you wouldn't, most people wouldn't believe this, but some people were going, oh my God, that is so exciting. Other people were absolutely devastated by that possibility. I crushed. They could not believe because a lot of people live on this premise that, but what about all the things I've done? Particularly if we've done a degree and we've, well, my wife's a great example. She did a five, four year degree in some extension, whatever business something, six years in college. And then when it came to giving up her designation as an accountant, which she fucking hated anyway, she goes, but what about all that work? And we see, we often position that as, well, if I, if I give that designation up, what I'm doing is turning my back on all that. No, you spend six years figuring out what you don't want to do. Do you want to spend the next 26 years doing the same shit? Or do you want to change the narrative? It is the, you've needed to do that to understand who you are. Oh, man. Yeah, that resonates. So like louder for the people in the back, man. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And, and, I've, and, and with respect to chiropractics, who I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a massive fan of chiropractic. Um, I've, I work with, over the years, a lot of chiropractics who are struggling with giving themselves permission to say, you know what, this is who I was five years ago or 10 years, but it's not who I am anymore. Yeah. It's just not, a, but they struggle with how do I let go? And the biggest challenge is they're not, they're not building widgets. They're not producing, you know, whatever it is. They're doing something that's very meaningful. So it makes it twice as hard to relinquish their attachment to that. And attachment is something we haven't talked about, but attachment is something like getting attached to goals and attached to who we think we should be is a huge Achilles heel for a lot of people moving forward. Let's talk about attachment because I can tell you just what you've just described. And I know I haven't spoken to you in a couple of months, but I closed my clinic in April of, of oh, 2019. Wow. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. So this was a huge thing for me, you know, very successful clinic, meaningful work, excellent patients. And I was so attached to the idea, well, if I'm not going to be a clinic owner, then what and who am I? What am I if I'm not a doctor who's running this big clinic in downtown Toronto? What am I? And I was attached to you know, the, the stories of, you know, women that I've helped breastfeed with their kids and, you know, the back pain that we've, you know, all the, all the things, all the things. So let's, let's talk about attachment because I think not just for myself, I mean, selfishly, I want to talk about uh, attachment because every time, anytime I get to a, an opportunity to learn from you is always a good one. But I think that this is going to be so useful for the people that are listening and we don't even realize what we're attached to. No, we don't. We haven't, we just don't even know. And, you know, we're, we're, we're attached to the attachments themselves. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're, you know, it, it's that, it's that deep within us. There's a gap, there's a gap in the world. And the gap is this place between, you know, who we can be and, and how we want to show up in the world and the attachment and the, <clears throat> excuse me, the enormity that we place on its, on its value. So with goal, you know, goals that I often see is, well, I want to turn, I want to, I want to, you know, make $10 million. And I go, well, it's so interesting to me that it's 10 million or 1 million or 5 million, which demonstrates to me there's no substance other than it's a round number. And, and to me, if you break it down, let's say, well, I want the freedom. And they say, what does freedom mean to you? Um, and, and so on and so forth. And you get into what the real issue is that's driving this goal. Mm -hmm. But there's something about this beautiful place, this place in the middle where you can be aspire to want something, have beautiful intentionality about something, but to let go of the attachment. I'm gonna, I'll give you a real life example. A lady contacted me, who again, I've been working with, and she said, oh my God, I've got the most incredible opportunity to write a book with the biggest, single biggest name in the industry in the realm that I'm in. So let's just say she's a chiropractor, which she's not, and she wants to write a book. And the biggest name in chiropractic, the biggest authority in chiropractic came to her and said, I want to co-author a book with you. And, and that was the opportunity, right? So it's interesting that she's phoning me, which is also telling, 
Mm-hmm. But she's not going, hell yeah, what the fuck am I wasting my time talking to McKernan? This is a hell yeah. Right. Man. Right. She already knew there was a question mark. So the very first question I asked her was not, well, what's the revenue split? How are you going to do this? Who's writing it? Who's not? Who owns the rights, the IP? All the intellectual stuff that people will go to first. My first question was, how much do you want to write a book? Oh, that's a good question. How much do you want to write a book? How important is it to you? And she's rubbing her hands. She goes, oh, the current's just testing my commitment, like my, you know, my tenacity and my, you know, my desire. And she says, give me a number, a scale of one to one. I said, one to 10. She says, 152. I said, well, there's your first problem. She goes, excuse me? I just shown you how much I want a book. I said, yeah. How much do you want to be in a relationship with another man or another woman? 152%. That's not healthy. That means you need that person to define who you are. You need that person to journey this world with because you will not be fully complete without them. Which is going to happen is that in that scenario, you're going to miss the red flags. You're going to choose not to see them. And that'll come back to haunt you in the future like it did for the girl who walked down the aisle and was betrayed by her husband. She betrayed herself years earlier. doesn't mean that what he did was okay. I'm not negating the behavior. I'm presenting the idea that she had a large part in this. I said, you're way too attached to writing the book. Hence, you're going to miss subtleties. Number one, do you trust this man? She goes, well, you know, I mean, would I give him my wallet? Maybe not, but, uh, you know, I mean, you know, he hasn't, I haven't read any bad articles. I said, do you trust this man? Yes or no? She goes, oh, fuck. She goes, no. And then she turned around. She says, you know, McCurney, you're an asshole. Because I was presenting this very thing she did not want to see. Yeah. And I said, do you want your name on this book? on a bookshelf or on Amazon for the rest of your life next to a person you do not trust or value. She goes, no. So she gets off the phone, tail between her legs, upset, disappointed, depressed, down, whatever, wakes up six months later, writes the book. And I quote, writes the book and completes the book in six weeks, the book she wants to write. And it goes to number one in Amazon and not just number one in her category, number one in Amazon in sales for six weeks, eight weeks, whatever. And now she runs a company helping people actually write books, et cetera. The idea behind that story, which is absolutely 100% accurate, the little maybe tiny details that I can't always remember all the stuff, but is the attachment that we place on the thing we say we want or the thing we think we want is actually part of the problem. That is profound. What was that? I said that is profound. It is profound. I don't mean profound from me. It's profound as an idea, as a concept, as a, as, as a, a spiritual opportunity. In, in humanity. It's, it, you know, we're so attached to being a mother. We're so attached to our children. We're so attached to, you know, um, I, I talked with a client recently and he started to consider the mortality of his own children for the first time in his life. And he said it was one of the most frightening things he'd ever done. But in some weird way, by, by thinking and, and, and creating some space to journal around the very thing that is his greatest fear in the world, it allowed him to relinquish not responsibility, but this idea of control. And as a parent, for example, and I know you've probably heard this multiple times from me, and it's probably the most obnoxious advice I'll ever give to a parent, but the best parenting advice I have for anybody in the world is no matter what you do, you're going to F your kids up. And people go, well, does that mean you just give up on them? No, you never give up on anybody, but you let them go. You let go of this idea that you, it, you're, it's your job to be perfect because you're not going to be. Hug them too much, they're going to be in therapy. Never hug them at all, they're going to be in therapy. Hug them in the middle, well, they watch their sibling being ignored a little bit, so they're going to be in therapy. They're going to be in therapy regardless. So it's not about giving up on them. It's just letting go of this idea that it has to be perfect, that you have to be perfect, because as long as you've got a pulse, that ain't possible. It's just not. So how do we release the attachment? So how do I release the attachment? I mean, one of the things I had, you know, and I'm happy to share this with my listeners, you know, when I was going through my separation, one of my concerns was my kids. You know, what's going to happen? My kids are, you know, they're going to have a, you know, two parents that have different philosophies or different views on things. And shouldn't I just stay in it for them? And what you said at the time, um, I mean, you had, you know, you had said a few things, but one of the things that you had said at the time was, you know, you're going to have a conversation or it's something you had said something like you're going to have a conversation. Imagine your son comes to you in 20 years and says, I'm in this relationship. You hate it. Or he, he hates a relationship. What should I do mom? And I say, Oh, you should leave it. He's going to say, but you, but you didn't. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the question about how do you, how do you relinquish 
an attachment. Um, you know, here, here's the answer to that. Here's the, here's the intellectual answer. You, 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 you write the attachment on a letter and you burn it. You write it on a balloon and send it up into the sky. You tell yourself 50 times as a mantra that you relinqu- relinquish you know, attachment to these things. All these different tools and modalities, I'm not saying they're all useless, but I'm, I'm just not a massive fan of that. What I'm a massive fan is understanding the origin of the attachment. Going into why you're attached to it, which is in essence the only way to begin to relinquish it. So for example, I was at, at a couple's thing. I believe you were in the room that day and, and, and you may remember this. Likely crying. Uh, <laughs> I think it was just Geo doing all the crying. Um, <laughs> I only mentioned that because, you know, you brought it up earlier on, but I, I, yes, I of course. don't talk about my work. Uh, it's, it's, I know it's just, it's a confidentially privacy thing. Um, but there was, there, was, there was a couple in the room, and I'm almost certain it was that day, and one of them says, what, what do you do with money? Because my wife sat in for you know, little bits of it in conversation. Yeah, yeah, now I'm way more involved in it. Mm-hmm. And um, I clarified and said, what do you mean? Make money or spend money? Which, which is, says, no, no, well, what do you do like bank accounts wise? And um, they had each very large attachments to what they felt they should do in the relationship. He wanted a joint bank account, and she wanted her own personal bank account. And I said, so forget about what we do as a couple, because if you think of what they're asking, they're asking what we should do to maybe model what we do, which is fine, but it's also fundamentally flawed because when you keep modeling everybody, it's very hard to establish who you are and what you want in the world. So it's, it can be healthy, but it also has an Achilles heel to it. And I said, forget about what we do. What do you guys do? And they explained what they do. I said, what do you want to do? Because, well, I want to, I want to join bank account. And then he looks at his wife and his wife says, well, I want my own independent bank account. And I said, why? She goes, because I want my independence. Hmm. Every female head for sure in the room is kind of like doing one of these go girl, like nodding, almost like cheering and saying, yeah, that makes sense. And at that point, again, my intellectual mind, my, my, my strategic mind would go, well, why don't you do both? Why don't you have a savings account that sits separately and then money goes in there and then have a joint account for your bills? Do you see the strategic answer? Mm-hmm. But that doesn't solve shit. And I'll tell you why it doesn't solve shit. I looked at this lady and I said, so you have an independent bank account right now? She goes, yes. I said, so do you feel as a woman independent? Oh, plot twist. Yeah. And she started crying and she said, mm-hmm. no. Mm-hmm. I said, have you ever felt independent in your life? She said, no. I said, now let's talk about independence because this has nothing to do with money. Right. It's nothing. And that's why the intellect versus soul set, the, the mindset versus mindset's great. It's brilliant. It's just, we've given it too much value. Yes. And the, the idea of the emotional part of it, because everyone would agree we're emotional creatures, you know, in the, in this world, yet we're not honoring that part of us. And then we went into this beautiful conversation and, and, and every, like when I think about that, I remember her, her husband looking at her going, Oh my God, when I was asking questions and breaking into this conversation and he was looking at her going, Oh my God, I didn't know any of this stuff. Now, of course, I now know why this, is, this conversation is going around in circles and has been for five years or whatever amount of time. Mm-hmm. We got into the, the beautiful narrative and conversation and exploration into where independence sh- hasn't shown up in her life and her desire to be independent, which her, was her desire to be in control. And control is, di- is driven primarily by insecurity and, and so on and so forth. And that's the difference between an intellectual solution because a lot of us are, are looking for intellectual solutions to what are emotional challenges. Right. Great temporary solutions, but they never solve the issue. They always reemerge, always. So when we think about getting more attuned with our emotions, you know, one of the things that's been very useful for me, and this might be just a, an, you know, an exogenous tool, but, you know, meditation has really helped me, uh, choose between the primitive reaction that I want to have, whether it's fear-based or anger-based or, you know, whatever it is, and the, how I would describe, you know, the higher version of myself or the adult version of myself, the, per- the woman, the person, the human that I, that I want to become. Yep. Are there, when you're thinking about developing your emotional resiliency, your emotional, you know, grit, if you will, is there is it sitting? Is it journaling? Like one of the things we know about therapy is one of the most important parts of therapy is the integration. You had said this before with the books, like you can't just keep reading books if you're not going to integrate the information in a meaningful way into your constitution and your actions in your daily life. So do you have practices that maybe have worked for you or for your clients in terms of being able to develop the, uh, 
the skill or the the ability to sit with the emotion first i think that's you know it, it's simple but it's not easy is there no, absolutely. is there, yeah i think there's a big distinction between between sitting with an emotion and and using some sort sort of modality to avoid the emotion so i say this jokingly but i'm actually not joking and please take this in the way that it's meant um is some of the angriest people in the world are yoga teachers oh that's very true okay and vegans and, 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 and vegans yeah, and 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 a, and a lot of people are using different modalities to hide, like for ang anger management. Mm -hmm. People are using meditation, which is a is a, is, a, is a very sacred gift or tool, whatever perspective you have on it, which will allow you to enhance your journey in this world. Mm -hmm. Meditation was never designed to suppress or to allow you to manage negative feelings or avoid emotions. So sitting with yourself and, and clearing your thoughts and everything else doesn't necessarily address the underlying issues that, 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 that continue to present themselves in your life. All I can tell you is from a personal perspective, the number one thing that has worked for me, okay, when I was, when I was very lost, very uncertain about who I was, um, really you know, lonely in this world for a very long time, not that I figured it all out, not even close. Um, I remember going to a therapist and the therapist saying, I didn't even go to therapy because I was way too fucking cool for therapy. I was, I was no way I needed therapy because I, I was, I was, I had too much ego and everything else. And this therapist presented this idea because I started to coach people at that point. And he said, what happens if you meet people who have got deeper issues that you don't want to address? I said, what are you proposing? He said, well, you could refer them to me or not, whatever. And I said, well, I don't know what you do. So why don't I go and do six sessions with you? Because that's your kind of requirement. And I'll never forget the very first day I went to therapy in this man's house. And I turned the corner into his living room. There's two chairs, one with the biggest box of Kleenex I'd ever seen in my life sitting next to it. And I was one of those Jerry Maguire moments. I'm thinking, what the hell's going on? He must have a bad cold. That's how ignorant I was. Mm -hmm. So I sat down in the other seat to which he said, you're sitting in my seat. I moved over. And I'm thinking, I'm just here to check this out. Like, I'm still the cool guy. I got my shit figured out, even though I was lost as hell. Um, and I'd say it was maybe 45 seconds, probably 30. And all he said was, um, so tell me about yourself. And before you know it, I am absolutely, I'm bawling my eyes out. I'm oscillating into anger. I'm going back to sadness. I'm going back into confusion, back mm -hmm. to anger again. And I walked out of there and I just said to myself, oh my God, I'm completely screwed up. So to me, the most important gateway to understanding who you are, not just intellectually, but emotionally, and actually allowing yourself to live from a very deep intuitive place is to go back into your past. And this is not a promotion for my work. I believe in this so massively that I've created an entire you know, event in Ireland, which that's what we do, because I believe so much in going back into our past and understanding the traumas that we have, 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 have experienced ourselves and moving through some of those traumas and realizing how those traumas have given. That is the most powerful work I've ever created. Sorry, excuse me. That's the most powerful work I've ever created, but the most, empower, most empower, important work that I've ever done as a human being. Mm. The second thing is, is closure. Is every single person I've ever worked with has a corridor or let's just say the light at the end of the tunnel is a better place, a more peaceful place. And we've got three doors open on our right, three doors open on our left. One is my mother, who I haven't spoken to in six months. The other one is my brother, who I don't have a great relationship with. And we're, we have a standoff and I'm waiting for him to apologize. He's waiting for me. The other one is a business relationship that I'm afraid to shut down. The other one is a business that is high. Closure, start leaning in, closing those doors. I don't mean cutting the people out of your life. Sometimes you have to, but having the conversations the, we're, at any point, I think every single human being is avoiding a conversation in their life. Having some of those conversations create immense closure, bring great peace of mind, and allow you to focus on the things that are important. Almost everything we want on earth is beyond a the, the one or two conversations we're unwilling to have. And we avoid those conversations like hell. And I think the more we have, I had a conversation in Ireland, which I won't get into right now, that has freed me beyond belief. And I didn't even know how much it was holding on to me. And it was a conversation I've been avoiding for probably six years. Wow. I think, you know, when you, you know, the body of your work, and I can, I can speak, I've, I've gone to a couple of your talks. I haven't done Brave Soul yet. I know uh, many people who have. But when we think about, you know, one of my big focuses is longevity. And I like to take the, I like to look at the science. I like to do the, I like to run through the ATP production and I like to be very intellectual about it. But when we think about fostering 
longevity and thinking about how we want to live a long life, you can't really do that without developing the soul set that you're talking about and, you know, this, this relationship with yourself. So just in, in, in closing, I just want to thank you uh, so much. What you do is you foster connection, you know, with yourself and with other people around you. If, uh, if people want to get to know you, you know, find you, I don't know if you're, I don't think you're on, you're not very active on social, but where can people find you if they want to find out more about you? philipmckernan.com uh, or onelasttalk.com. Amazing. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a great conversation. We'll talk to you very soon. Thank you.